Okay, so this slide looks a l very similar to um, our last, um, for the, our approach for the East Rift Zone lava flows. We have our observations and photography. In this case, for the East Rift Zone, we had, our, we had mapping here. And for the summit, we have lava level. But in a way, they're, they're equivalent. Because on the East Rift Zone, we have flows that are spreading out on the surface, right? So we need to know the horizontal extent of the, of the lava. But at the summit, we have lava that's contained within a crater. It's moving up and down. So we want to know the vertical extent. So we track that by measuring the lava level. And of course, we also sample as well. OK, so visual observations, that's you know, obviously the, the core of what we do. Um, OK, so we're at the Holly Mamaw Crater Rim here. And this area has been, has been hit by spatter from explosions. So we have to wear helmets. We have gas masks here. Just at this moment, the plume is being carried a little bit away. So we don't, we're not wearing our, uh, we don't have our gas masks over our mouths. But commonly, most of the time, it is uh, you know, uh, very gassy there. So, um, very high concentrations of SO2. Um, and we're wearing, let's see, uh, well, we try not to wear synthetics because um, we don't want them to melt if we're hit by something. And we, we're running our cameras here. OK, so the lake is, well, obviously, we take visual observations, we take photographs. But the lake is an exceptionally dynamic place. So it's great to be able to document that activity with video. So this is actually video of the spattering that was happening in the lake on Thursday night, so just last week. Here, here you can get a sense of the, you can see the crust getting ripped up. See, this crust is, is really thin. It's just centimeters thick. And you can see these large kind of bubbles bursting. So one of the things we've learned about the lake is it's very, very gas rich. Um, it's almost like a foam. So the spattering is the mechanism that the lake you know, basically releases that gas. And these are large, you know, you have many bubbles in the lake. They coalesce into huge, you know, meter or yard size bubbles, and they burst at the surface here. OK, so we go out basically every day um, to Halemamo, um, but we can't be out there all the time. So again, just like on the East Rift Zone, we rely on our webcams. And here's a thermal camera actually looking in to the lake. And the other benefit of the, of the webcams is the, the fact that we don't necessarily want to be down there all the time because uh, this area has been hit by spatter. So it's, it's, a, very da it's, you know, it's a dangerous place. Um, this is from November 28th, of, uh, so just a couple months ago. There was an explosion that threw, here's um, spatter, uh, you know, large dinner plate size spatter that was, uh, fell out all around the camera. Actually, the camera was hit by smaller pieces. It wasn't damaged, but actually it landed on its power cables and um, those had to be replaced. So we don't necessarily want to spend too much time down there because of the hazard. So again, um, that's why we rely, we rely on cameras. So you may have seen this uh, video before. So this is uh, the kind of the normal outgassing plume in the first year of the eruption. And then obviously, there's a change. We have this explosion. Um, and it was actually, this is really cool. This is one of the first explosions that we really captured well with video. Um, this is basically from the HBO Tower. We had a continuously running um, video camera up there. Um, this explosion threw out basketball-sized volcanic bombs all around the Holy Memo Overlook. Again, it's a reminder of why the, the area is closed. Um, but what's really cool is that the cameras can obviously help us learn about these volcanic processes. For instance, there was a debate initially as to what was triggering these explosions. Um, but Tim was able to basically kind of provide a smoking gun for what he thought was happening. So here's a camera looking in the lake uh, in March of 2011. You'll see what process triggered the explosions. So did you see that huge yeah. section of the crater wall just collapsed in? And that's what triggers these explosions. Here, that was actually pretty cool, so I'll show that again. <laughs> <laughs> so, again, um, the lake is very gas rich, and this explosion, you know, part of it is just this very violent release of that gas. And of course, carrying spatter up and, uh, you know, small particles here. And then when the dust clears, you know, literally, you'll be able to see um, that the lake is obviously really agitated, so it really triggered a lot of. Um, 
you know, possibly bubble nucleation or bubble coalescence. Here you get a sense of just how active it is and how agitated. Okay, so, yeah, so keep your eye on this section of the lake. This was about two years ago. Yeah, so there was a large collapse there. Um, again, it triggered an explosion, it triggered this intense spattering, and you see this sloshing of the lake surface. This is when the lake was really high. Yeah, this was just before, um, around the time that it spilled over the, um, uh, onto the floor of Halimama. Okay, so, um, and it's, these webcam images are useful not just to look at, you know, kind of events like that, but just to look at the, the normal routine behavior. So when we do our daily update, one of the things is we review kind of the time, this, we have the computer systems automatically produce these time-lapse sequences every day or every hour of the preceding day's images. So you can kind of look, get a synopsis of the activity. Here's just from actually this morning, min, uh, from midnight to uh, into this morning. And you see the, the normal lake activity upwelling in the north part of the lake, flow towards the south, a little bit of spattering activity. This is with the thermal camera, of course. The thermal camera has the benefit of being able to see through that fume that often obscures views to the, to the normal webcams and the naked eye. Here's some more spattering. But you know the cameras are continuous, uh, acquiring continuously, and they've done this for years, so that we can just also look at, say, the last year of activity. So this is starting last January, and we're going to show a whole year of activity in the lake. Um, and you can see the lava level move up and down. And you can also see this inner ledge built of solidified lava. It builds up when the lake is high, and then it collapses in when the lake drops and kind of removes support. So the inside of that overlook crater is you know, continuously getting kind of rebuilt and, um, well, and disintegrating. So here we are in October when the lake got really high. It actually spilled over briefly. OK, so you see, obviously, there's lots of ups and downs at the lake. Um, what's one cool thing that we can do with the um, images is that uh, we, can, we have some computer scripts that basically automatically track the motion of the lake. Um, so these arrows are just basically showing all the, the, the flow direction on the lake surface. And this is you know, basically tracked continuously. Um, we can also track the amount of spattering in the lake, the, the flow velocity, and the flow direction. We can look at where the upwelling is, upwelling area is. It's normally in this part of the lake, which is up there. Um, so yeah, so we can do some cool quantitative things. And it's another way to keep track of what the lake is doing. OK, so talked about observations. Now let's look at lava level. OK, the, the, the standard way that we measure lava level is with a, just a, a simple laser rangefinder. Um, and here we are taking a measurement to the lake surface. And this is the lava level, actually, or, uh, during 2016 at the top here. You can see lots of ups and downs, but overall there's this upward trend. So it's particularly since September, and many of you probably already know that, that the lake has been you know, really uh, very well visible, uh, very visible from the, the Jagger Overlook just over the last several months. And uh, the interesting thing is here we've shown ground tilt. So the ground tilt is kind of like, uh, it's a measure of the pressure in the magma chamber. And so when we have uh, let's see, deflationary ground tilt, we can see that for all of these peaks and troughs here, we have you know, corresponding um, uh, peaks and troughs in the tilt. So when we have deflationary tilt, you know, the magma chamber is deflating, um, that pressure is dropping, we have the lake level drop. And then when we have inflationary ground tilt, the lake level rises. So when the, when the system, when the, lake, when the magma chamber is pressurizing, we get the lake level rising. So this is kind of cool. This is actually a, a cool new result um, uh, uh, from the current eruption showing that the lake is kind of like a liquid pressure gauge of the magma chamber. So, and obviously, you know, tracking the pressure in the magma chamber is one of the main things that we want to look at because that's going to help forecast, you know, uh, new vents or new eruptions on the, on the rift zones. So in a way, the, um, the lake is kind of like a giant liquid barometer. Okay, so there, there are fancier ways to track the, the lake level. One, another one is with LIDAR here. And so we work with these guys at the uh, Army Corps of Engineers. We don't own one of these. These cost about the same as a small house. So 
Um, but they're, they're really cool. They, they produce really detailed laser scans of, of, of the crater. So this is back in 2012. They produced a really nice scan of the whole Haleamama crater. And then this is the Overlook crater here. Then we can kind of pop inside the, um, the crater here. And at that time, the lake was much lower than it is today, and it built this inner ledge of lava. And we can kind of wrap around to the south side. And then you'll see that this Overlook crater wall is really overhanging here. And so that's why we have these explosions. Um, the, these crater walls are overhanging, and when they collapse, obviously they're unstable because they're kind of unsupported. When they collapse, they fall, the rocks fall directly into that lake, trigger the explosions. OK, another way we can look at the geometry of the crater, again, is with the thermal camera. So in 2011, we had the lake drain. Um, we basically had an intrusion on the east rift zone and actually a new, new vents open. And the, the lake basically completely drained. So it left the Overlook crater basically completely empty. So this is, yeah, over, this is sped up. It basically drained over 24 hours. It dropped about 140 yards. Yeah. And the, the lake at this time was about 150 yards originally across. So yeah, we had this empty crater. So um, we flew around the crater with, in the helicopter with a thermal camera. And we again collected a series of overlapping thermal images. So here's the crater. You can see down deep in there. And you can get a sense just um, from the image sequence that this is really deep. Actually, there's a little lava pond at the bottom. Um, you can get a sense that it's really deep, right? But obviously, we want to put some numbers on that um, and see if we can get anything quantitative about how deep it was and you know, the dimensions of this crater. So we can take those images, those overlapping oblique thermal images, put them into our structure for motion software. Here's that crater, vertical view. So here we'll look at kind of a cross section of the crater. Yeah, so here's the floor of Halemama Crater. And here's uh, the upper part of the, the Overlook Crater. You can see it has these inner ledges here. And then it has this kind of near, kind of, uh, kind of near vertical shaft here. So. So the volume here of this empty crater was something like 2 million cubic meters. Um, I, I, um, thanks to Google, that's the equivalent volume of two Empire State Buildings. So, so yeah, but, um, we were able to actually measure you know, the dimensions and the volume of, this, of the crater just based on you know, uh, thermal images. OK. so. Observations, lava level. Now let's talk about sampling. Here's Don. I don't have a sorry. I don't have a helmet cam for uh, for Don sampling, but uh, he goes out every day, and he has a network of buckets. Um, and so the plume. Yeah, most of you have seen the plume. Probably all of you have seen the plume. Um, obviously, it's not as ash laden as you know these um, very large explosive plumes. But there are particles in the plume, and they're and they're constantly falling out, raining out. And so Don has this net network of buckets, and he collects that, um, what falls out. So I'll show you what, what comes out. Mostly, um, we have uh, a lot of Paley's tears, also these small glass spherules, and lots and lots of Pele's hair. Actually, many of you have probably been to the Holly Mama parking lot before the, the eruption started. And this is what it looks like now. So just mats and mats draped over the, curb, uh, the curbs, which are hard to see. Lots of Paley's hair. So I showed you that earlier video of the spattering, right? And it sh had these, vid um, you could see the bubbles bursting, and basically this lava is be basically getting strung out um, and spun um, into strands of volcanic glass. And that's coming out constantly because the spattering is, is almost constant in the lake. OK, so we collect all this data. Um, but what do we do with it, or why do we do it? Well, the main reason we do it is to provide hazard assessments to emergency managers and the public. So that's, that's our charge you know, from, um, from Congress. And uh, so we don't have the authority to enact, uh, you know, to uh, do closures or um, evacuations. So we simply provide information and hazard assessments. We hand that to emergency managers, which might be the National Park or Hawaii County Civil Defense. And then they decide how to act upon that information to uh, protect the public. So here's a, a meeting from uh, 
late 2014 when the lava was approaching Pahoa. And obviously there were a lot of concerned uh, citizens at that time because the lava was so close. Um, and we interact, of course, um, during that time actually it was, it was a great opportunity to interact um, directly with the public here. Here's Tim actually with a big um, printout of one of the, the most recent map explaining the map features and um, explaining the current activity. Um, one of the main ways that we get our information directly to the public, though, is through our web page. So we have daily updates, we post our maps, and we post our videos and photos. Um, and, of course, we have webcam views, too. They show, they show real-time views of, of the activity. Okay, so we also have a responsibility to the scientific community. So one of the things that we have to do, obviously, is document the activity, um, you know, for the... For the the broader community. We want to record what's going on, and uh, we do that in reports. We also publish in scientific papers, and so we try to analyze the data. Um, and the whole idea here is that we're trying to you know, do the research to understand, to better understand how the volcano works, and with the idea, the hope in that, that's going to help improve our hazard assessments. You, know, the better, you have better hazard assessments when you understand what's going on. And um, I should say that, you know, in a um, long time ago, uh, science was kind of more um, kind of discipline focused and you might have a seismologist just publish on the seismic data or a, a gas geochemist just look at um, the gas geochemistry. But these days it's much more multidisciplinary. It's almost expected um, that you're going to integrate different kinds of data. Um, because it makes sense, right? If you're trying to understand how the volcano works, how a process works, why not look at all the data available? So this is just an example of a recent uh, study we did where we, you know, we were looking through the video frame by frame and then trying to, trying to match that to the seismic data coming in to, to understand exactly what was going on. So uh, the future, well, um, obviously it's, it's a really exciting time uh, because you know, technology is moving so quick. And these are just a few things. It's obviously not uh, complete. I'm probably missing some things. But it, just in the near future, um, you know, I work a lot with thermal cameras, and their price has come down dramatically just in the last uh, 10 years or so. Um, actually, you can get a camera, the same camera uh, that was, well, same capabilities, basically a tenth of the price that they were 10 years ago. So um, they're becoming much more common. You can even buy little um, thermal cameras that plug into your smartphone. Um, more frequent lava lake me level measurements. Obviously, it'll give a, a better idea of, of what the lake is doing, and we're working with um, Cambridge folks um, who have, uh, are testing a radar device, and we're also hopefully installing um, a stereo camera setup uh, to make more continuous lava level measurements. So in the coming years, uh, we often get asked about drones, and I don't personally work with them, but um, obviously there's a lot of potential um, for drones. Um, obviously, you get that bird's eye view, um, right now, there's, there's still a lot of, of red tape and regulation, um, and also the, the, there's some technical limitations. I, I think some of the popular drones that people use now just have flight times of 20, 20 minutes or so. So that would be hard, you know, because the flow field is so expansive to be able to, to use something like that today. But you can imagine, obviously, they're going to be coming better in the future and more capable. And uh, so I, I would expect that they're going to be playing a, a part in monitoring in the future. And also, um, these LIDAR, these laser scanner units, are coming down in price and also being miniaturized, mainly because of the drone industry, um, because they're trying to attach them to drones. So I think our, our surface mapping, our 3D surface mapping, is going, to become, is going to become cheaper, and so therefore it's going to become you know, better and more, more, more common. But you know, regardless of all of these changes uh, going on in, in technology, there are some things you know, that never change. There will never be a replacement for you know, watching the activity uh, you know, with a naked eye and seeing it in person. That was true 100 years ago, and it's still true today, and it will continue to be true. Um, but the great thing about the activity at, in Hawaii is that it's very accessible. So you know, it's not just HBO geologists who participate in the observation. It's uh, the general public can, um, can be a part of observing the volcano. So, uh, if you want more information on HVO, we have lots of information on our website. Here it is. And uh, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. The taking that offshoot, you know, in the 
Oh, you mean just up to the summit? Yeah. Well, there's there's deep magma, so. Um, Can you repeat? The oh, sorry. Yeah, the the question is, um, uh, we have the East Rift Zone where lava moves laterally, um, but the uh, it seems like the path of least resistance would be to move upwards. Um, so, yeah. Uh, well, um, we have magma that's very deep, so actually, I mean, even a little bit of deviation from vertical could eventually, um, you know, result in kind of lateral movement. But, yeah, the, even then, well, right now, actually, we have an open conduit in the, in the summit and magma moving laterally, basically, from the summit chamber 12 miles out to Puo. So, yeah, it's not necessarily the easiest, uh, the, you know, vertical movement isn't necessarily the, the perf always the preferred pathway. Uh, yeah. Aside from the collapsing that you showed us in the video, which mm -hmm. caused a, a small disturbance on the surface, what what would what what commonly precipitates major eruptions that you know where you get a lot coming out violently from, from deeper depths? Oh, okay. So yeah. So what I showed all of these these explosions, for instance, are um, are pretty small. They're obviously nothing compared to like a Mount St. Helens. Um, all right, are you talking about Kilauea in particular or volcanoes in general? Kilauea. Okay. Yeah, so Kilauea, I mean, we have small events like that. We have kind of moderate events like in 2011 where we basically had magma accumulating at the summit. Pressure was building, and magma basically broke out of the conduit. So basically the rock failed, and, it, and magma intruded out to the surface, and that drove fountaining. So you have this magmatic pressure. But then when the magma reaches close enough to the surface, then gas starts to come out, and it's this kind of feedback loop where it's like a, you know, popping a champagne cork where um, you get a lot of gas exolving, and so that drives the, you know, a really violent explosion. Well, not really violent on a grand scale, but for Kilauea. Um, so it's a combination of kind of, yeah, magmatic reservoir pressure, but also gas pressure. Mm -hmm. So it seems to me what would drive it to the east rift zone would be the weakness below, and when you build up enough pressure, hydraulic pressure above it, it's going to seek, like water does, its way down to the East Rift Zone. Yeah, so there is, that's what's, one of the cool things about the activity that's going on is this is the first time, really in the historic record, last 200 years, that we've had long-term eruptions at the summit and on the Rift Zone, um, you know, lasting longer than a year or so. So what we can do is we can actually track the lava level at this, those two eruptions. And what we notice is that when the lava lake goes up and down at the summit, the, the lava in Puo'o moves up and down in concert. Um, so we know, and we know from other data sets that there, yeah, there's a really efficient hydraulic connection between the summit and Puo'o. Um, and actually, um, even though the, those eruptions are separated by something like 12 miles, the lava level at the summit is only about 100 yards above the lava level at Puo. So yeah, there's almost this kind of hydraulic equilibrium between the two. Yeah? Is the diameter of Holly Mountain Mountain Crater now substantially bigger than it was before the 2008 activity began? Yeah, OK, so I realize I've been forgetting to repeat the question. So. Um, yeah, the question was, uh, is, has the, uh, the new crater at, in Halemamau, has that enlarged? Or do you mean the, the crater that's holding the lava lake? Where the lava lake is yeah. now. Isn't that bigger than it used to be? Yeah, yeah, it sure was. Um, so when it first opened in March of 2008, it was about 35 yards across. And now it's 250 by uh, 190 yards across. So, and, well, you, I've already shown you how that enlarges. You saw the... the the videos of the collapses triggering the explosions that, oops, sorry. Um, the, the, craters, uh, the crater wall is, is often overhanging, so it's, just, it's very unstable. Actually, it's overhanging because the lake heats and cracks uh, thermally, kind of erodes the, the bottom parts of the wall, so it kind of makes this overhang. Sometimes you can actually hear that at Jagger. If you hear a popping or a cracking sound, um, that's very common. That's just basically thermal expansion of a, and cracking of the, of the rocks on the wall. Yeah? You mentioned Mount St. Helens. What, how many different kinds of volcanoes are there? <coughs> uh, yeah, it really depends how you, 
how you categorize them. I mean, sometimes people categorize them as to what composite, uh, like stratocones or shields. Um, yeah, I don't know. There's, it's just kind of depends on how you. It's it. I you know when I, I look through um, textbooks and it seems like or or web pages and everybody has their own different kind of classification scheme. But obviously, yeah, St. Helens is a is a composite stratocone, so it's built up of layers of uh, of lava flows and ash deposits. Um, so it tends to be obviously steeper. Um, Mauna Loa and Kilauea are built up mainly of, of uh, very fluid um, lava flows that are often tube fed, so it carries the lava farther, and so it, you get this, you know, uh, kind of a broader uh, slope. We have time for one more question. Then. Okay. Yeah. Why is the spattering at the walls and the edges, and really there's no activity in the body in the, in the middle? Yeah, that's that's actually a good question. Um, so. A lot of the spatter. Okay, so a lot of the spattering is actually tri Oh, sorry. Yeah, thank you. Um, why is the spattering at the lake margin, right, and not in the center of the lake? Um, it's a good question. I don't know if I have a great answer for that, but um, a lot of the spattering is actually triggered by small rock falls. So you think of the the lake as this kind of foamy, you know, liquid. Um, a lot of that spattering is actually, it's kind of like a smaller version of what you saw in the video of the explosion where there was a big rock fall that obviously triggered a lot of spattering. If you have a really tiny rock fall, um, it can basically, you know, either puncture the crust or just pierce that foam and trigger spattering. And obviously, those rock falls are only going to be happening from the, from the crater walls. So it seems like that's one explanation. It may not explain all of the spattering because sometimes you do get spattering that doesn't seem to be triggered by rock falls. That, I don't know. I mean, there may just be a zone of weakness where the lava is subducting at the lake margin. So that kind of allows the gas to be released there. Right.